Hello and welcome to another episode of Trash to Track. In this episode we're going to be looking at this GNR Ren R1 Southern Region steam tank engine. Um, this engine I've picked up uh, over a year ago now and uh, this masking tape here is holding a spare part on it I believe which I didn't want to lose and it's uh, oh it's the front coupling hook that has obviously come adrift since purchasing it. These tank engines really are robust and this started its life with uh, Hornby Dublo before Wren acquired it. And this is obviously a later version that was made by Wren. Giving this Loco a quick battery test and we'll see if it's a runner. And to my surprise it is actually quite a strong runner. So it's not going to take much hopefully to DCC fit this little tank engine and return it to service. I really do like the stocky little appearance of this tank engine. I'm going to fit an AE models decoder to it eventually, so let's start by taking this long screw out of the chimney which holds the body to the chassis. The rear of the body is held on by a clip that passes through the body shell which I showed you earlier on a few seconds ago. Lifting the body shell off we see a similar, oh well, there we go, uh, for some reason the previous owner has filled this with sort of like a plasticine or putty thing to add weight which is surprising as the chassis on this model is quite weighty in itself. I'll just remove the other front coupling there so we don't lose it. So here's the chassis, it's got an open X04 type motor in it, although it isn't obviously an X04 one, and some associated wiring. The motor is held onto the chassis there by these two screws, so undoing these will release the motor and then we can give it a good service. Even though it is a runner, it hasn't been serviced in God knows how long, so it will need a good clean up. The motor is held on with two screws, which seems to be a bit overkill, but hey, it works, and obviously the Wren engineers, all they had to do was work with what Hornby Dublo provided. Once the motor screws have been undone, the motor simply lifts out, and we're going to snip that wire off there. As I said, we're going to DCC fit this model, so all the pickup wires will have to be separated anyway. So I just snip that off with a pair of side cutters, and now the chassis and motor are separate, we can look at start servicing the motor. A battery test across the brushes proves that this motor is lovely and strong running, and a magnet test later on with the screwdriver also proves that the magnet is very strong and will not need remagnetizing at this time. Getting a cotton bud of meth, so I just put it in the gap there, and you can see there's a lot of carbon and dirt buildup, so this is going to require a total strip down and a good cleaning up as even though it's running very well, it is particularly dirty, especially over the top here. This loco probably hasn't been serviced since it left the Wren factory in the early 1980s. To remove the brushes, it is a simple case of removing this spring and the brushes fall out. The spring is held in the back of the motor there with that lipped screw and just is held in place with friction force. The brushes don't look too bad, although they do have some wear on them. They will last a good few years yet. And as I said, the magnet there is still very strong, so I've got no need to put this through the remagnetizer. Now that that's all been stripped down, I'm going to use some of this contact cleaner and I'm going to give it a blast through the uh, worm gear there to remove any of the dried up lubrication. And also in the back of the motor there where that carbon had built up, just to remove all that uh, built up rubbish. And I'm also going to give the axles a good clean out as somebody who had owned this before me, had actually put really thick, almost Vaseline-like grease on them. Now that the contact adhesive, um, the contact cleaner, <laughs> don't put contact adhesive on it for God's sake, but now that the contact cleaner has evaporated naturally, I'm just going to clean the commutator faceplate there with my cotton bud and methylated spirits, and then I'm going to polish it up gently with this fiberglass pencil, as there's some grooves on this from its age, and there's quite a lot of build-up of carbon on the brass parts. Work gently so that you don't score the brass parts. Now that it's all been cleaned I'm going to clean out the gaps in the brass commutator with a shaved down toothpick just to ensure there's no carbon in between the plates there and then that is the motor pretty much serviced and ready for reassembly. The brushes I'm going to give a good clean up as well as there's quite a lot of carbon on these and using a cotton bud and mess, I just give them a good scrub in and remove all the carbon deposit that are built up on the brass. I do clean that gap in the brass there, but this was unnecessary really, as I'm not going to be relying on the spring piece to conduct electricity when we rebuild this. 
I will be soldering the motor wires directly to the brushes. A bit of oil in the bearings on the end of this motor and you can see the Hornby Double origins of this motor although as I said it was bought out by Wren but it's clear to see where its origins lie. The spring piece there I'm going to put heat shrink sleeves over both of the ends of this. I'm just going to remove that small piece of solder there and then as I said I'm going to cover both parts of this spring with some heat shrink tubing as it will need to be insulated from the motor when I DCC fit this model. I put the heat shrink tubing over the ends there and just shrink it down with the heat of my soldering iron. Once this is done on both sides of the spring I simply trim the ends up and then the motor is ready for reassembly. It really didn't take long to service this motor and it does look really clean now. I was surprised with how much muck actually came off this considering how strong a runner it was. So as I said, just trimming off the ends of the heat shrink there. And now I refit the brushes with my needle nose pliers and both brushes are insulated from the motor and the pickups now, ready for fitment of the DCC decoder. Sometimes I do find fitting these brushes to this sort of motor quite fiddly. The spring there kept popping out the back, as unlike the trying ones, the screw has a shoulder on it and it is just a friction fit, so it doesn't take much to push the spring out. Once both brushes are fitted and insulated, I'm just going to give it a quick battery test again to make sure that all is running well. And the motor there spins really nicely, having had a full service and a brand new lot of lubrication on it. The next thing we're going to look at is the chassis. And I'm going to start by cleaning up all the old manky crud and um, Vaseline type grease that's still remnant on the axles. I mean, it really is horrible stuff, as you saw on the cotton bud there. This took a lot of work and I must have spent 45 minutes on this chassis just removing what was in a sense Vaseline from all the axles. It was particularly difficult to get off that middle axle as it was they're quite thin um, gaps and I didn't want to remove the wheels. But having worked on it for a while it is a lot more free running than it was. I'm now just going to put the motor back in place and hold it with finger pressure just to and then I'm going to apply the battery just to see how free running the wheels are. As I hold it in place, as I said, I'll find the battery. Applying the power shows me that the wheels turn freely, more freely than they did when we first started this. And that is good because it's less strain on the motor. These, re these old Hornby Doubler and Wren steam engines really are built like tanks. The next thing we're going to tackle is this pickup plate that I removed from the bottom of the uh, chassis. And I'm just going to clean the pickups there with some cotton bud and meths and then polish the um, pickup parts with my fiberglass pencil to ensure that everything is crystal clean, ready for reassembly. For digital running, you really do need clean parts. Any dirt will interrupt the signal and will lead to jerky running, and nobody wants that, otherwise it can put you off running entirely. Once it's all been polished up nicely, I just give a quick polish up there to the backs of the wheels, to where the uh, pickups are going to press against, and then clean off any residue from the fiberglass pencil using, again, a cotton bud and methylated spirits. I work over a paper towel with this so that I can dispose of it afterwards so that any stray fibres from the pencil end up in the bin and not in my fingertips. There is this blue plastic insulating piece which I've given a clean up to. That fits on only one way. As you'll see there, I actually put it on... Uh, the wrong way there and I was just getting a fiberglass strand out my hand there as just as an example of how not to do it. This blue insulating piece actually fits around this way so that all the holes line up and then the pickup piece goes back on and is screwed back firmly into place after sliding the wire through the relevant hole in the die cast chassis. The pickup plate is held in place with two rather bulky flat headed screws. Everything from this sort of era, Hornby Doubler and Wren, is always bulky and mechanical and it is a real joy to work on. There's no fiddly electrics, no tiny little screws. Everything is magnetic and everything is just that slightly bit bigger, making it very easy to work on. Now that that's all back in place, I'm just going to give a quick bit of lubrication to the axles there, as obviously we've removed all the lubrication by taking that horrible grease off. And I lubricate all the axles with a tiny amount of oil. 
I don't put grease on my axles as it can transfer itself to the track and then you've got a whole major task on your hands cleaning your layout track. I also put a dab of oil there on the worm drive and then I'm going to put some of this silicon grease on the worm drive from the motor and then we'll look at mating the motor back to the chassis and then look at fitting the DCC decoder. The motor simply clips in as I showed you before clips in and engages with that cog on the middle wheel and then we can replace the two screws that go underneath. The holes are clearly visible there either side of that axle. Every screw on this model is a flat headed screw which also shows its age as models with Phillips screws only came along in the late 80s and early 90s. Do not over tighten these, well I don't think it's possible actually to over tighten these as everything is threaded to a degree. If you do try and over tighten it, it won't work. But as I've said before, if you try and over tighten these screws, you can end up de-threading either the screw or the hole and your motor won't sit in properly and the loco won't run. Now that the motor is back in place and the both brushes are fully insulated, I'm just going to put a small amount of oil on the top of the worm there to make sure that the drivetrain is correctly lubricated. And then we're going to look at soldering the DCC decoder in place. I've already stripped the harness down on this and got rid of the wires we don't need. And for anybody that's not seen me do this before, my method is red and black to track, orange and grey the other way. So your red and black decoder wires are your pickups, and the orange and grey wires, as you can see here, are soldered directly onto the brass for the brushes. This is why we needed to insulate both of them as any short circuit and you're in danger blowing your decoder and wasting 20 quid. Gentle heat there just allows the two wires to stick to the brushes and once that's set I also solder the red wire to the rear tab that you can see sticking out of the motor there and the black wire links to the wire that comes from the track and all exposed surfaces are then covered in heat shrink tubing to prevent any short circuits in the future or when we try and replace the body shell. Once that's all done I just put the decoder into its harness when I can figure out which way it goes that is. Sometimes it is difficult while filming having the camera in the way, but I'll get there eventually. No, it was the way we did it first time. Come on, get a grip, man. Once that clips in nicely, and don't push it in with too much force as you don't want to bend the pins in there, I'm going to put it on the track and give it a quick battery test. Now, if this runs, everything should be in order. And there we go. The chassis is running on DC power. There's no short circuits, although the wheels are pretty dirty as I haven't cleaned them yet. But it's running and I'm happy. That means that we can now move on to have a look at the body shell of this R1 tank engine. The body shell is covered in a sticky residue and the front has got some splashings of silver paint on it. I'm not sure what this is that's coating the body shell. I've got it in my mind that it is years and years of grime from people's fingers. It doesn't seem to be weathering paint as it is still very tacky and horrible. And this stuff inside here, this plasticine stuff, well I chip all this out with a flat bladed screwdriver as it has all gone rock hard and is not actually adhering to the body anymore. Like I said before, I'm not entirely sure why somebody would put this in here. I have read and seen online that people think the R1 tank engine is a light engine. It's not light at all. The chassis is die cast and quite heavy. Indeed, it's heavier than other trains I've got. The Dean Goods that featured in episode 1 of Trash to Track is not as heavy as this R1 tank engine is. This stuff really is horrible and it takes a while before it all comes out. It's all emptied onto the workbench there and I sweep it all into the bin. This representation of a driver there is also held in with it. So eventually, by chipping away with this screwdriver, I managed to remove it all and the driver falls out, but I will keep him for refitting later on. Look at it, it's almost like play clay, it's really horrible. Now, I've speeded the footage up here as I tried to remove the dirt on this model and I was working on this for an absolute age without any sort of effect. And I just thought after about 20 minutes, that's all it removed back to the plastic and I just thought I'm not wasting my time with this. So after about half an hour working on it, what I did was I put the body shell in some Mr Muscle oven cleaner in a sealed carrier bag overnight and it removed most of the paint and all of that grime. The only bit of paint it didn't remove was that red on the front there. The heat stamped British Rail logo and number I'm going to remove with this 1200 grit wet and dry. 
work steadily until you've got a smooth tank surface. And then I'm going to repaint this model entirely into a new coat of satin black livery and we're going to put some new embellishments on it. Like I said, work slowly with this uh, wet and dry and use the highest grit you can. I'm using 1200 grit and that doesn't seem to affect the body shell too much. The heat printed numbers on the cab side there needed some different method of removal as the, water, uh, the wet and dry wouldn't, um, wouldn't touch it. So I'm scraping it off here gently using my fiberglass pencil which just removes all the heat stamp and colour and then I finish it off with the 1200 grit wet and dry. Once this is done I give the body shell a quick rinse off in some cold water, let it air dry overnight and then give it a coat of Tamiya Fine White Surface Primer. Now that the body shell has been primed and the primer actually looks quite blotchy close up, we'll have a look at some of the detail. As you can see there there's a representation of a vacuum pump, there's some rivet detail around the smoke box end, a cast smoke box door dart and number plate. There's rivet detail on the buffer beams and there's also this brass pipe work and handrails on that side. I've removed the chimney cap and the safety valves from this for repainting. On the rear you've got a moulded coal load and some lamp irons. All in all, considering its age and it, it dates from the Hornby Dublo range of the early 60s, I really do like the detail on this little tank engine and was tempted to paint it bright blue as a certain famous tank engine to run on the preserve line. However, stay tuned for a different video featuring Thomas, as I'm actually working on something else entirely. But here you can see the R1 in its first coat of satin black. And then after a couple of days, I would painted the handrails, detail painted it, and put the red on the buffer beams. And now we're going to put transfers on. Using some transfers that I've already got in stock, I'm going to replace the large British Rail logo that was printed on it with a relatively smaller one from this Fox sheet. Damping the body side with a cotton bud there. And then I remove the transfer with a pair of tweezers and gentle pressure from a toothpick. Once the transfer is on the body side, I gently blot off any excess water with a dry cotton bud and then use some decal fix just to hide the carrier film. One thing I will say before I actually do this is before applying the transfers, I did give the model a coat of gloss varnish just to hide the carrier film. Once the transfers were all in place, I gave it another coat of gloss, followed by a coat of satin, and then it was left 24 hours between each coat, so it took about a week from painting transfers to the varnish being fully dry. I'll skip now to when the transfers was all done so that you're not bored with me applying loads of different numerals, and the R1 is starting to really look the part again. I've put the 2P classification on that was missing, the um, handrails have all been painted, as I said, the smoke box number there. And even though that side looked a bit blotchy, that's just a thing from the camera zooming in too much. It does look like it's blotchy, as I said, but in real life, you can't really see that. I'm pleased with how this has come out so far, and it is a far cry from the grime encrusted body shell that we started with. The satin black really does set this tooling off. But now that everything's th thoroughly dry, we're going to start by putting all the detail parts back on, starting with these brass turn safety valves that just push into the top holes of this model. Well, they should be a push fit, but now it's been painted, the holes are slightly smaller. So I use my long um, tweezer nose flat pliers just to push them fully home. These are a very good friction fit and require no adhesive to hold them in place whatsoever. It's the same with the four buffers. These are a friction fit into the, into the buffer beams there and they do not require any glue. They are serrated and fit into gaps on the plastic just like that. Once all the buffers are in place, I wasn't keen on the black buffer shanks. So I gave them a coat of the same red that I'd painted the buffer beams. And then again, this was left to thoroughly dry overnight or 24 hours. The red paint really does set these buffers off. When the model was new from the factory, these were actually unpainted metal items, but I much prefer them painted. It really does look a lot better. Once the red was done, I also gave the buffer heads a new coat of black paint and it was all set aside to dry, as I said. Whilst the paint was drying on the buffers, I put the chassis onto the rolling road just so I can clean the wheels up. Giving up a good head of speed, I used the fiberglass pencil to polish up the wheels there and once the wheels have all been done I then follow this up with a cotton bud dipped in methylated spirits 
I even cleaned the middle wheel there, even though it provides no electrical pickup, as it's better to have all clean wheels and leave some dirty, otherwise it will just transfer it to the track. I also repeated this process on the opposite side, and I also give the wheel backs a good clean again, just because they're rubbing on the contact pieces. Once that was all done, I noticed upon reassembly that the chimney cap there was cracked. So holding it in my hand, I just put a little amount of plastic weld cement and let that seep in just to fix the chimney cap back together. Once that had thoroughly dried, we're going to now start to reassemble the model. What I'm going to do with the representation of the driver there is I'm just going to use a very small amount of Loctite superglue and put him back into his position using my tweezer nose pliers and let him dry. It just gives a bit of extra realism to this tank engine. The couplings here have obviously been bent into an L shape and they fit in grooves that have been cut in the buffer beam by the previous owner. These again were pushed back in place and then again fixed with a very small amount of Loctite superglue. Because one had fallen out before as you saw and it was held in place on the body there with the masking tape so I didn't lose it. However this proved to be a bit of a mistake as the rear one was too far um, into it and wouldn't allow the body shell back on. But we'll come to that in a minute. The decoder there was fixed into the cab roof with some black tack. The wires were all tucked in neatly and I engaged the clip into the back of the body shell there. Once that's in I gently pushed the front of the model down over the die cast weight and then retrieved the long screw out of the magnetic tray and put it back through the chimney to secure the body shell back to the chassis. As you can see there it was actually the front coupling that was foul not the back one as I'd taken it off. I'm just giving it a quick battery test there to make sure no wires have been snatched while putting the body back on and like I said the screw goes back in and this is tightened up but this is imperative that you do not over tighten this screw as the chassis is threaded this screw will just go and go and I think that's one of the reasons why the chimney cap had been cracked is the screw had been over tightened in the past. The front coupling has now been cut down to a smaller size and with some Loctite adhesive I just gently push it into the gap that was been cut in the buffer beam and then this R1 tank is ready for entering service on the preserved line when it's been rebuilt. In fact I have actually forgot there is one more thing to do on this model. That is to fix the rear coupling back on. Now I go through my spares of screws as the screw provided was extremely loose in the hole and I find a very small M2 screw which I believe is off an old Backman model but fits in the hole really well. So I use this to tighten up the coupling on the rear although I don't think this coupling is an original Wren one but it seems to do the job. So holding it up level there I just use a Phillips screwdriver and just tighten the coupling up there just so it's not going to fall off whilst running around the layout. And then the R1 is about ready. I'm just going to use the uh, long nose pliers there just to bend that coupling chain into the coupling so it's not foul of any rolling stock. And then picking the model up and having a quick look around it, I'm really pleased with how this restoration has come out. Just putting it back on the track there just to make 100% sure nothing was wires were trapped. And let's remind ourselves of what we started with at the start of this rebuild. This old Wren R1 tank engine had, was covered in a sticky residue of dirt. It was a runner but could have done with a service as the motor and that had a lot of carbon deposits built up on it. The coupling had actually fallen off the rear of the model and the model body shell itself was full of old plasticine to add as a weight which if it had crumbled and fell off and got into the motor would have really hampered its operation. The paintwork on this was lacklustre and the transfers or heat printed transfers really didn't do this model justice. And this is what she looks like now. Fresh coat of paint, fresh transfers, detailed painting, DCC fitted and fully overhauled in service. Ready to go back into service when the Garden Railway reopens, hopefully in the spring. I really do like this stocky little tank engine from Wren. So I'm going to leave you now with some shots of it running around the layout and you'll hear that when it's running after I've finished the voiceover there is like a high pitched whine to the running of the motor but it runs absolutely lovely on digital considering the age of this model. If you've got an engine you'd like to see featured on a future episode of Trash to Track 
email me at dansmodelrailways at gmail.com and we'll have a look at getting it sent over and it might even feature in a Trash to Track episode all of its own. I'd like to thank you all again for watching Trash to Track. I do appreciate the support you're giving the channel through these videos. Please stay tuned as the next Trash to Track will not be, uh, will not be far behind this one. And I'll catch you again in the next video. Thanks for looking. Please like, share and subscribe. And I'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.